Well, we are going to take a break from the book of Luke for one week as we talk about uh, this Mother's Day weekend. And we're going to look at a very unusual passage that I think celebrates God and mothers in a very unique way. If you've ever read the book of Isaiah, it is a very long book with a lot of judgment. But it's actually known as the mini Bible. The reason it's called the mini Bible is because it starts in the first chapter talking about sin and our need to be rescued from sin. And then by the time you get to chapter 53, you get the most accurate picture of Jesus in probably the Old Testament in Jesus being our suffering servant who will bear our stripes and will, will uh, be forgiven for, will be punished for us so we can find forgiveness. But what's particularly interesting is that the book of Isaiah has 66 books and there are 66 uh, chapters rather and there are 66 books in the Bible. When you get to the final chapter of Isaiah... The last chapter is all about God coming down heaven to reign on earth. It's about the millennial kingdom coming and residing on earth, what it's like to have God here and now living on earth, and then ultimately the judgment that occurs afterwards. But most of chapter 66 is all about God's millennial kingdom, God's reign, what you and I might call heaven on earth. And the metaphor used most in Isaiah chapter 66 to describe heaven on earth is mom, his mother. Isaiah must use five or six different mother metaphors to describe what heaven on earth is like. And all through the scriptures, God refers to himself as a father. But this is one of the places that he clearly shows his work is like that of a mother when he will in the future bring heaven down. Now, this is a very challenging time that Isaiah speaks into. Israel has gone through a very difficult bit, and they've been divided into a northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And with that, they've been captured by the Assyrians, and then they will be captured later by the Babylonians. In the middle of all this turmoil, God says, I want you to know that when you're waiting on my promises, when you're going through difficult times, I'm a mother who watches over you. I have promises for you. And I am going to bring my promises to bear in your life. In fact, here's how he says it toward the end of the chapter. I love this part. Speaking of Israel as a mother and him as a mother, he says, Be glad with her. Some of the new Jerusalem he brings down on earth. All you who love her as one whom a mother comforts, so I will comfort you. So if you remember your favorite moment with your grandmother or your mother... You scraped your knee or broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend and you remember mom comforting you or wrapping her arms around you. Or maybe you had a mother who maybe wasn't as comforting. You had a mother who was really good at convictions and telling right and wrong and duty and commitment. And maybe you lacked that comfort. And God says, I, I want to be the ultimate example of comfort that you saw or that you needed. And so there's three ways in this passage that we, you and I can act like a mother. And I hope as we do that, we're going to be able to, one, celebrate our mothers who were patient because they could wait on the Lord. We're going to celebrate the joy of our moms, what it means to become a mom, but also what it means to comfort each other from God and how often God comforted us through our mothers or grandmothers or women in our lives. Let's begin with the first one. What does it look like to wait like a mother? Now remember, Israel's been in a very difficult time and they're going to go through 70 years of Babylonian bondage before they get to the place that God's going to bring them back. So there's a long wait. Maybe you've waited. Maybe this Mother's Day is a reminder that you are waiting on some promises from God that are not happening right now. And you're like, I'm starting to give up on God. I'm starting to think he doesn't act. I'm starting to think that maybe until I get to heaven, there's just nothing he's going to do in my life. I'm feeling alone. that's exactly how Israel was feeling during this time. They're like, oh my goodness, and you're telling me it's going to get worse before it gets better? He says, yeah, 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 yeah. But what I have for you, heaven on earth, the promises I have for you, they will come true, and they will come true in a way that if you wait on me and you trust me while you wait, it's going to be very surprising. In fact, look how he says it. It's very interesting. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Now, isn't that unusual? No, it's typically you'd have to wait and it would be even longer than you thought. Before even labor came, birth popped in. Before the pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? 
And what God is saying here is that he can accomplish in one day. It's going to feel like there's no way God's ever going to put this back together. We've just been waiting, 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 waiting. If you've been waiting as a mom, or maybe you remember how much your mom waited on you, waited for you to grow up, waited for you to mature, waited for you to obey. It's hard to wait. But God says, what's amazing about my promise is it's going to feel like, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of late, I'm in the middle of pregnancy. It's still like a hundred years before God does anything. I'm going to accomplish in one day so quickly my promises. It, you're going to say, who could accomplish such a thing in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? You see, you've been taken away from your homeland. Your nation's been destroyed. But I'm going to put all the pieces back together again. It's going to feel like just one day when I do it. For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery? In other words, if I start a work in you, like getting pregnant, I'm going to follow that work to completion. And even though you're waiting longer than you might want, God says, I am there as a caring, loving mother in your life. Now, if you're Israel, this sounds crazy for a lot of reasons. The Assyrian Empire, that section of green up there, just monstrous. And so they were living in Judah, or here in Judah and Israel, and so they have relatives that have been scattered to all different directions. What's the chances you're ever going to see your relatives again? What's the chance of the Assyrian Empire, then conquered by the Babylonians, then conquered by the Persians, that we're ever going to come back to our homeland? Not a chance that we're ever going to get back here. And God says, you're going to think there's no chance I can do this. There's no way I can fulfill my promises. But in one day, I will accomplish it. Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Now, we're on the other side of history. We're still waiting for heaven to fully come to earth, right? As the ultimate expression of motherhood. But there have been several times since the writing of Isaiah that God has accomplished amazing things in 24 hours. It'll be 24 hours that Babylon will be destroyed by the Persians. In one 24-hour period of time, they overtake the whole kingdom. It happens in the book of Daniel, validated by history. There's one day, literally one 24-hour day, that, that Nehemiah will walk into the king of Persia and say, Hey, I'd like to take everybody back to the hometown. You conquered our enemies, but we're all scattered throughout your kingdom. And in one moment, in one signature, in one day, Nehemiah will get all the resources, all the protection, and all the material he needs to lead everybody back to the promised land. In one day. For hundreds of years, Israel didn't exist for centuries. There are all these promises in the Bible that God would one day return his people to their land. That in 1948, in one day, the nation of Israel became a nation again. Just like God has said, but everybody's like, well, that must be a metaphor. There's no way he could literally do that. And all of a sudden, this nation appeared that didn't, didn't even, wasn't even existent for centuries. It happened so quickly. What thought could never be done. In fact, in 1991, the government in Ethiopia was about to be toppled to a government that was hostile to Jewish people. And so the U.S. government in 1991 had this operation called Operation Solomon. And in one 36-hour period of time, imagine this, 14,324 Ethiopian Jews were airlifted from Ethiopia to Israel in 36 hours. It happened so quickly that these Ethiopian Jews were returned to their homeland that three women gave birth on the plain. So as we look to the past, we can see ways that God has worked his promises out at times when people felt like this is never going to happen, this is never going to come through. I remember when we were pregnant with uh, our first, with uh, Sierra. So Beth was uh, pregnant with Sierra. And of course, what do people ask you when you're pregnant? When do you do? When do you do? That one day becomes so important. So I know, the day was something like you know, July 1st or something. I just know, you know as a mom when the day passes. Because you've said, I, could, I can make it to July 1st. I can make it to July 1st. And then every day after that is like, oh, this is ever going to happen. This is ever going to come through. Especially in a hot Atlanta where we were when Sierra was born. And so as we're trying to navigate how to get these promises to come through quicker, there's a pasta place in Atlanta that promises that any pregnant woman that eats their spaghetti sauce will give birth the next day. 
So we show up to this pasta place and it's got like proof. There are Polaroids, back when people used Polaroids, Polaroids all along the wall of all the women. I'm talking hundreds of women who 24 hours after eating here have actually given birth. And so Beth and I are eating our pasta. We come home, wake up the next day, and now, 24 hours later, huh, our picture's not going on the wall. It's like, this is a promise. There was evidence. This is never going to happen. I remember we're sitting in our living room on a couch. We had a CD changer. Remember when those were popular? Our CD changer was spinning, and it happened to rotate around on shuffle to a CD by Wes King. And he had a song called, We Thought You'd Be Here By Now. It was just one of those perfect moments where we were feeling kind of melancholy and the song hit with just the right lyrics and my wife and I just cried together on the couch as we were just waiting. Waiting on God's promises. Whether it's little things or big things, whether it's for health, for healing, for a prodigal to come home, for a relationship to be restored, it's, it's difficult to wait. But when we wait like a mother... We're confident that God will continue the work he's done even in the midst of the long wait. So I'd like you to hear the story of a mom, my friend Kristen. And Kristen has been on a unique journey of learning how to wait on God and trust in him in the meantime. Let's watch. My personal journey to um, becoming a mom was a little bit, a little bit different when I was younger Uh, I was told that it was going to be very difficult for me to conceive later on in life and that there would be a lot of things medically necessary to help and I was going to go through a lot of surgeries and a lot of different things that would make it very, very difficult for me to have children. And that was very devastating for me because I've always wanted to be a mom. So hearing that it might not happen was just completely devastating that early on and When I got married, Peter and I prayed through the whole process and he understood what it meant to go through the entire process of trying to conceive and having my own natural kids. And so we prayed and decided to to stop medications and and just try. And we were given a timetable and it was a very stressful timetable, Um, but it was okay because we... I was okay with the process because I had been preparing for it. Every month I was supposed to take a pregnancy test just to make sure that I wasn't pregnant or that I was. So I could keep, you know, on with my daily life. And the first month was just routine, got up, took the pregnancy test, it was negative, threw it out, went about my daily life. Next month, same thing, got up, Peter went to work, it was just a normal day. It had already become something that was just going to be part of every month's schedule. So I got up, I took the pregnancy test, put it on the counters, kept getting ready for the day for work and everything. And I picked it up just to make sure before I threw it away. And I remember stopping in my track because I noticed a faint line that wasn't there the last time, but it was very faint. So I kind of panicked and I didn't know if it was yes or no. And I didn't want to get my hopes up because it was only the second month and this was supposed to be a years and years of a process. And I called my sister-in-law and she was like, okay, go to the store, get a couple more just to test off them. Okay. Came home, tested them all. They were all glowing positive. And I just remember sitting on the edge of my bed, just laughing and just thinking, how incredible it was to trust a God who fulfills his promises. The best and the worst part about waiting to be a mom actually in my life were the same thing. It was trusting that God's plan for my life is better than my own. And I am sort of a control freak. And knowing that in my life, it's very easy to look back at the choices I've made in my life and say, you know, waiting was also in my benefit, but also in my heartbreak too. So knowing that I was going to have to wait and wait and wait, but the process of that and the process of prayer and the process of trusting that his plans are actually so much better than my own, 
actually made me grow closer to him because of the fact that I didn't know. There was, there was no clear answer. All of the doctors said, ironically, hey, the best thing for your body would actually be to have a baby, but it's also going to be really difficult. What? <laughs> so waiting on his promise was actually the most growing process ever because I had to lean into his promises instead of my own. So whatever you're waiting on, God wants you to know that it may be taking longer than you ever imagined, but his promises will come true, and when they do, they're going to come fast. The second way we act like a mother is to rejoice like a mother. I love this second passage because he talks here about how motherhood was designed to be a source of joy. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad with her. All you who love her, rejoice for joy with her. All you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. Just look at all the joy words here. Rejoice and be glad. I even love this section, to rejoice, to rejoy yourself with joy. Motherhood can be very wearing. With all the disobedient kids and all of them, I told you to do this, I told you to do this. Rejoying yourself to see the women who've impacted you in your life and to rejoy them by reminding them you notice their kindness and you notice their sacrifice and you notice their love. And as a mom, don't forget to rejoy yourself to remember that God designed you and designed you as a woman to be used for joy. To drink deeply from him as your source. To be delighted in the abundance of glory. And remember, God is telling some people here who are not really in a particularly joyful time. Friends have been scattered off. They've been taken away from their homeland. This is not necessarily joyful circumstances. But God says, in the middle of that, I want you to know that I am still with you. And my promises are still true. And I want you to hold on to me for joy. I want you to experience me as your source of joy. And I want you to be participants to the, to the others in your life, the mothers in your life, as a source of rejoying them as well. I think no one has captured the joy of motherhood better as a poet than Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know if you know his poet, or his poem rather, uh, to my mother. Here's how it goes. Because I feel that in the heavens above, the angels whispering to one another can find among their burning terms of love none so devotional as that of mother. Therefore, by that dear name, I long have called you, you who are more than a mother unto me, and fill my heart of hearts where death installed you in setting my Virginia's spirit free. My mother, my own dear mother, who died early, was but the mother of myself, but you are the mother to the one I love so dearly, and thus are dearer than the mother I knew. By that infinity with which my wife was dearer to my soul than its soul life. It's interesting, Edgar Allan Poe here mentions three moms that he's rejoicing in. His real biological mother died when he was two years old, in 1811. So he references his mother who passed away. He had another mother who was his foster mother who raised him from two to age 18. Her name was Frances Allen. She struggled with infertility and was told she could never have children of her own. Yet she found that the way she would rejoice despite not being able to have children is that she would be a foster parent and she was a foster to Edgar Allan Poe and helped raise and shape someone who shaped our literature uh, of the, the whole world for centuries. But that's actually not who he writes about. This is Frances Allen. The one who raised him. And he loved her and had a great relationship with her. But when he wrote the poem, it's a poem written to his mother-in-law. The one who raised the one that I've come to love. What I love about this poem is it's a reminder that there's so many ways in which God wants us to honor the women in our life. Our mothers. Our grandmothers. Our biological moms. Foster moms. A mother-in-law. It also means that whatever role you play in people's life, whether you're someone's aunt or someone's grandmother, someone's neighbor, biological mother or foster mother or adoptive mother, God wants us all to find the joy of exercising the purpose he has for us, even in circumstances like, the, like Israel had that wasn't exactly what they would have chosen. 
What does it look like us for to rejoy ourselves? What does it look like for us to experience the joy and share the joy of motherhood? My friend Patty is so good at this. She loves mentoring young mothers. She says, one of the things I tell young mothers all the time is in the hustle and bustle of all the challenges and frustrations and annoyances of being a mom, don't forget to enjoy your children. Oh, their differences drive you crazy at times. She says, but I help moms remember to enjoy their children. Remember when they're driving you crazy how much you long to have children. What a gift they were. What a joy they were. What a pleasure they were. I think that may be what God wants us to do today. To rejoy ourselves. Remember, he's the source of our joy. To rejoice some woman around us by thanking them for how God displayed his attributes to us through their, through their love or through their joy or through their celebration. In fact, as I was interviewing some folks for this service, I was talking to my friend Blake, and I said, how has God taught you about joy and about faith simply by being a mother? Here's what Blake had to say. Let's watch. I have learned the most about God's love for me through being a mother than any other stage in my life. I heard a sermon recently um, about the Father's heart and how... Um, he, the person speaking related it to um, how you feel about your own children. So when your first is born, you don't realize that you have the capacity to love this child the way that you do. And then, uh, you know, you start experiencing things with the child and you're like, I can't possibly love another child more than I love this child. And then the second comes along and you say, you know, I'm not possibly going to have room in my heart to love the next child more than this child and there's just this space that you were created for and you were designed for that you didn't even know that you had in your heart Um, and that place will never go away for for your love for your children and you know you love your children um, but can still be disappointed by your children Um, you know there can be temper tantrums there can be um, you know discipline at school there can be all these things but your love for them, that place in your heart doesn't go away. And I guess I, I relate that to how my Heavenly Father feels about me. That love that I never would have known about had I not had children, um, which I love my husband so much, but it's a different type of love, right? Um, being a mother or a father. Um, it's just to think of that that's the way that God feels about me. Um, you know, almost brings tears to my eyes. The thing that I enjoy most about the ages that my children currently are, which is 11, almost 10, and 7, is that we get to adventure through life together. Um, you know, when they're, when they're younger, you do so much taking care of. Um, and you still take care of, but in a different capacity. Um, so traveling together, we love traveling together. We love hiking together, experiencing new things together, learning about history together. That is what I love about this current stage of life. Um, I also like the small things, um, the the bonding in the car on the way to school. Now, sometimes it's absolute chaos and crazy and screaming and yelling, um, but most of the time we're laughing about it by the afternoon. So enjoying the little things. So I love that idea of rejoicing like a mom and God's promises in the moments right in front of us because they do go so fast. But then God transitions because, again, these are people who need to find joy in difficult circumstances. These are people who are waiting on God's promises. But he gives a third way to act. He says to comfort like a mother because they need to be comforted through loss and grief and difficulty. So what does it mean to comfort like a mother? Look what he says. It's very fascinating. He says, Behold, I will extend peace to her, talking about Jerusalem and and her people, like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles. Now this is a fascinating phrase. The glory of the Gentiles are going to flow to her like a flowing stream. You see, they've been under tribute to the Assyrian Empire for some time, Jerusalem was. 
So because of that, you had to take a portion of your goods and give tribute to them. Hey, thank you for holding us in bondage. Please don't kill us. So every week, every month, every year, you were sending a huge portion of your income as tribute to the Gentile Assyrians or tribute to the Babylonians. And so it was used to the world that was just about take, 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 take. And God says, I want you to know that I have promises for you in the future. And it's going to be not take, take, take. It's going to be give, give, give to you. You're going to be on receive, receive, receive. And the Gentiles who have been taking from you, I'm going to take the resources that have been taken from you. I'm going to re-divert them to you. And it's going to be like a, a river flowing to you. The glory of the Gentiles with all their kingdoms and all their empires that they built with your resources are actually going to flow to you during this time of heaven on earth. And I'm going to bring you peace, shalom. And it's going to also come like a river. Notice the word peace here is shalom. And it comes like a river. And the glory of the Gentiles comes like a stream. And you will be fed. You will be satisfied. On her knees you shall be carried and dangled on her knees like like a little child on your knees and you're doing little songs together. God says, that's how I'm going to treat you. I want to rejoice over you. I want to sing over you. I want to enjoy your company like a mother does with a child. But I know things are tough right now. I I know there's difficulty in your life right now. And though the time of rejoicing and rivers flowing is coming and I want you to hold on to that when you're starting to give up hope, Verse 13, as one whom his mother comforts. I want you to think about your grandmother or your mom or your wife or your aunt. Think about your favorite moment of comfort. We just felt like they were there for you. And they helped you through a difficult time. Because when you think about how the mothers have worked in your life in that way, so, just like that, I want to comfort you. And you will be comforted in Jerusalem. I'll comfort you now as you're going through it. And we get to that ultimate heaven on earth, Jerusalem. The comfort of everything will make sense. I, I will sort of explain all the things that happen and how I use this to work about that and how I use this to work about that. And you'll be comforted that God had a plan all along. None of it was meaningless suffering. None of it was outside of God's will. None of it was gone. And last week I mentioned how Jesus was so angry in clearing out the temple in Luke, if you remember. And I mentioned one of the reasons he was so angry is because God wanted both Jews and Gentiles to be in his family. He created everyone. Someone after a service at 8.50 said, why were there Gentiles coming to the Jewish temple at all? I thought it was a great question. And since Gentiles gets brought up here, let me show you a little example of that. This is the tabernacle, then turned into the temple built by Herod. And Herod, if you notice, there's an entire section called the Court of the Gentiles. So this section here is the temple with the Holy of Holies in that section. But there's a whole other section designed for Gentiles. God fears. People who are seeking God out. And so when God designed the tabernacle and God designed the temple, it was almost like a mother's hug with one hand around the Jews and one hand around the Gentiles. God wanted all his people to be together like a giant family. God wanted to comfort us because we all have the same problem. We're going to face death one day. And God was going to show us how he could comfort us as we grieve, but also how we could know that death would be defeated when his son came and defeated death on the cross. And so this idea of the Gentiles weren't the enemy. The Gentiles were actually other wayward children that God wanted to welcome into the family. This has always been the mother's heart of God. Jesus, when he watches Jerusalem and thinks about Jerusalem being destroyed, he uses a mother metaphor. He says, as a mother chick longs to protect, as a mother hen longs to protect her chick from the coming wind, so I, Jesus, long to protect you for what is coming to Jerusalem. Now, my mom was an awesome comforter. Often people say, you tell stories about your dad all the time, because my dad did more crazy stuff. And though I do a lot of things like my dad, uh, I am a lot like my mom. And my mom was an awesome comforter. She's an awesome listener. Incredible grace and love. And I remember just so many times, you know, breaking up with my first girlfriend, you know, and mom was there to listen. And mom was there to, you know, cry on her shoulder. 
I remember when, you know, being with some friends and just some friends where I feel like I was always on the giving side of the relationship with some buddies of mine and just, Mom, it just doesn't seem so unfair. And I just remember her listening and processing that with me. And I remember about 10 years ago and nine and a half years ago when we found out Quinn was blind. I remember getting on the phone with my mom and just saying, we got this news that Quinn is blind. And I just remember the comfort of God's promises and that God's still in control and God still has a plan. I got a text from my mom about two months ago and she said, Chad, I was pulling out my joy box. She's got this joy box. She said, I was going through my joy box, things that bring me joy. And I came across a letter you wrote me when you were 17, when you were on a mission trip in Europe. And it says here in the letter, Mom, I just thank you for the impact you've made in my life. Mom, you're my best friend. She said, I pull that all the time and just I'm so reminded of how much joy that brings me. And I said, Mom, you're still one of my best friends. And I just thank you. In fact, this week, Beth and I, we've been waiting on God for seven years for some things we've been trying to put in place for Quinn's life. Just had this amazing, how God in literally one day did what we've been fighting for for seven years. And you know, after Beth and I celebrated sort of some supports that are going to help set Quinn up for the next, you know, really, hopefully the rest of his life if, if everything comes through uh, the way it says. And I remember, you know, t- talking to Beth, and we're celebrating and thanking God for his comfort in the middle of these challenges. And then, you know, calling my parents up and telling my mom that she's celebrating with us and, and, and the, the concern she had for us. It also reminded me of a story my mom told me about when my grandmother died, her mother, Eileen. Eileen was just a wonderful woman. We played a lot of backgammon together, and she was a great cook, and she loves Tupperware. When we, when we opened her freezer when she died, we had to go, it was like one of those three feet deep freezers, you know, and like seven feet long and four foot wide, and she'd been putting leftovers in there for, I kid you not, a decade. I remember when she died, we started digging through the freezer. It was like 1985, 1982. We got down to the 70s. When we got to the bottom. There were actually stuff in the 1970s in that thing. I remember my mom telling me about six months after my grandmother had died, she said, you know, my whole life, every time something happened, the first thing I did is I, she used the dial-up, you know, I would actually call my mom. It's amazing that mom died about six months ago. This is many years ago when she told me the story. She said, I still, as soon as something happens with you or the kids or with the grandkids, one of the first thing I would want to do is I'd want to pick up the phone and call my mom. And I'd get like halfway into dialing and I'd realize, oh, mom's gone. And she said, Chad, you know you're grown up when you can't call your mom anymore. Hmm. This year, my friend Kathy lost her mom. And I was telling her that story, and I said, Kathy, what has God taught you this year, losing your mom, about his comfort and about his presence? And she shared just a powerful story, how God comforts us through our mom, but also comforts us with the loss of our mom. Let's watch. I lost my mom in October, right on her birthday. She died on her 88th birthday. Um, And it's, you know, it's been a pretty tough time. I think what I miss most about her is really the simplest thing. Honestly, I call her every day and she was always so happy to hear from me. She'd be like, hi, honey. Almost like um, talking to me was the highlight of her day. And I think the other thing I miss most about her is she just celebrated my family so much. Um, She was such a fan of my kids. She was always involved in everything that they did. God has given me great comfort during this time of my mom's loss, which I have to say has been so much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. And I knew it was going to be hard. Um, It comes in different ways. Simple things like I learned... Her favorite hymn was How Great Thou Art, and I find myself singing it in the shower, which just brings back, you know, just great peace and joy. Um, We've also had some really great family time, um, sharing stories of growing up, and my brothers are hilarious, so it's just been a lot of fun to hear their perspective in addition to mine and get to share that together. And then finally, kind of out of the blue, we were looking for something to do to honor my mom, And the church called with the idea of donating towards a new organ, um, which is perfect. I know that they would be really honored. They 
both my parents were in the choir for more than 50 years and it would be just what they would want. You know, I think what I love most about my mom is she was just the sweetest person. I had so many people tell me that she was the sweetest person they had ever met, almost almost like an angel. And so what that meant for me and for my family was that she never judged you. She just always gave you the benefit of the doubt and gave you grace. My mom was an amazingly strong woman. She just handled adversity without whining, without complaining, without making a big deal about it. And I really think her strength came from her faith. You know, I think one of the lessons she taught me just in her very final days was when she said to me, I'm not going to be sad because I've had an amazing life and I'm not going to be scared because I have great faith, which, you know, I just, it's something to really aspire to, to be anywhere close to that when my time comes. And beautiful. I love that we have a God who works and celebrates with us on the highs. He rejoices with us, and he also is with us in the valleys where he comforts us. So I think our application to this passage is one day there's going to be heaven on earth. And we want to thank God that he's the source of all things. And to thank the moms in your life for their patience, because many of them waited and are waiting and know what it's like to wait. So let's thank our moms for how they had to wait on us. Let's thank the moms in our life for the joy they brought to our life. Let's thank our wives for the joy they brought in our life. The way they brought joy into preparing weddings for our daughters and and for our families and the ways in which they make things special with their unique touch and unique hospitality. Let's thank the women in our life for, for the joy they bring and also for the comfort. In fact, I thought uh, we might end the service by honoring the fact that God is the one that speaks through our moms. So why don't you stand and join me? So I was listening to that last interview. I love the idea of singing the song that Kathy's mom sang with How Great Thou Art one last time. Let me pray for us, and let's sing that together as you think about maybe how God has been so faithful through the women in your life. Father, thank you for moms. Thank you for the women in our life. And thank you that they have been an incredible source of all the good gifts that come from you. Love and long-suffering and kindness and strength and hospitality and gentleness. And Father, we celebrate those who've gone before us. We celebrate those who are still with us. And we celebrate you for being the source of it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. From all of us here at Horizon, we'd like to wish all of you moms out there a very happy Mother's Day. Enjoy your week, and we'll see you next weekend.